past If I keep my mind on you You'd keep me in perfect peace Yes, you would You'd keep me in perfect peace With a sincere heart If I call upon your name You'd never turn away You give me everything I need. Yes, you would. You give me everything I need. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I came for deliverance. For deliverance. The deliverance I received. You said you deliver. You said you deliver. So that's what I believe. That's what I believe. Say it again, say it again. I came. I came for deliverance. For deliverance. The deliverance I received. You said.
Good evening to us. Everybody looking well, feeling well, doing all right. Hi, Pastor. All right, Miss Tanya, you're looking pretty, baby. How you doing? I'm doing. All right, all right. Dip, uh, after Stan gave us a selection, I'm not sure who's going to be on there for the prayer. And we're going to get ready to start moving. Thank the Lord for those of us who are present tonight. Give us a selection, Stan, and we're going to be ready to move. Oh, you know what time it is. Thank you. 
Let's just, let's just, Brother Demp, thank you for getting the scripture ready. Tanya, uh, would you get ready to give us a prayer, please, ma'am? Yes, sir. Please. All right, thank you, baby. Demp. Yes, Pastor. Give I, us a scripture, please, sir. I'll I be coming from Psalm 92. And it reads, it is good to be a thank to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your love kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. I put on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harp harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me read through your work. I will cry you in the work of your hand. Oh, Lord, how great are your work. Your thoughts are very deep. A sensitive man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the work are negative flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies are old. For behold, your enemies shall perish. All the work are negative shall be scattered. And we read Psalm 92, 1 through the ninth verse, as the Lord has been blessing to the real Israel word. Let's pray with Sister August. Lord, we thank you today for everything that you have done for us. We thank you for watching over us last night and waking us up this morning, and we're able to give you thanks. Lord, I just ask that you continue to touch our minds and our hearts, Lord, that we would receive the lesson that Pastor has prepared for us. Lord, we thank you for our pastor, Lord, and we ask that you continue to guide him and protect him, Lord, as he tries to tell others about your good name. Lord, I ask a special blessing upon new inspiration today individually and collectively lord you know what we stand in need of before we even ask i ask lord that you would continue to bless sister evelyn landrum lord that she would continue to heal i ask lord that you continue to bless annette and mr shelby lord lord i just want to say thank you for everything that you've done everything you're doing right now and we thank you in advance for what we know you will do this is my prayer in jesus name amen my god is a strong God. Give us a selection standing, and then we're going to move. I want to introduce to you right now a close friend and brother. To me, he is one of the best interpreters of song and spoken word. My friend, Pastor Marvin Winans, be blessed.
heard him. So let the church say, oh, lift your hands wherever you are and let the church. Church say, amen. God has spoken. God has spoken. Hallelujah. Let the church, Let the church say, say amen. All we needed was a word from the Lord. We've got it so. Let the church say, amen. Let the whole church say, The church. Let the church say, let the church say, man. Oh, I need you to say it when your dream's about to die. Knowing that God is not a man, He just can't lie. In spite of what, what the devil does. simply saying that that is true. We thank God for those of you tonight who have joined with us. Glad to see you, John. I hadn't seen you a little bit. Glad to see you joining with us tonight. Tonight, we have a very good scripture, one that ought to cause each of us as believers to take a serious look at ourselves and ask us, do we have that kind of a patient, preserving faith that will hold us when the world is appears to be trying to tear us down? Now, I've learned, it's taken a little while for me to get there, but I've learned in my 60 plus years of service that it taken patience to learn how to be a servant and to have a patient, preservant faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that preserving faith does not come overnight. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It don't come overnight. You go, you go, the devil gonna be on your trail. And baby, if you don't watch him, he'll get your tag and turn you off from having faith. He will have you believing that there is no need for you to wait on God. Go and do whatever you want to do. He will have you believing 
that uh, the Lord didn't mean what he said, but I want to tell us tonight that the Lord means just what he says, and he says just what he means. And I have a background scripture from the 40th note, Psalm verse 7, says again, I re-reiterate what I had shared to us Sunday in Psalm 40, where the Lord says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, and it's written of me to do thy will. Paul is just picking this up again and going back over it again, trying to get us to understand what it takes to have a patient, preserving faith. Amen. I'm going to ask, hope that you do it, that really we go back to verse 1. A lot of good meat between here and verse 23. In fact, about it, the author himself would even ask us to look at verse 22 to kind of splice this in together with what we are saying today. And this is the, oh, yes, what does verse 22 say? Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies wash with the pure water. It takes a little time, my brothers and sisters, for us to come to that particular point in our life. Let me just say this, my mother, try to move on to this. Do you ever, every now and then, kind of look back at yourself, ask yourself some serious question to yourself about ourselves since the Lord gives us some options, since the Lord allowed us to have some choice, since there is some variety in our lesson, a way of thinking. What conclusion do you come up about self and thinking about self should do? In this way of thinking, the only real mistake is to limit one option or to give up on some option in favor of another. All of this can make the path to Christian discipleship very difficult. God Almighty, very difficult in choosing to follow Christ. I'm a run a risk. Somebody that is listening to my weak voice, since you began this journey, you have had some questions in your mind about whether or not it was worth me making sacrifices to be a child of the king. Or should I go on and the young folks say, let it all hang out and do my thing? Amen. And if you'd be fair with yourself, some of these situations ran across mine, not a time, but many a time you had to fight with yourself, about yourself, to yourself. Can I get a witness here? So, so today's text lie at a point of a transition from exposition to exaltation. Other words, from what is being said to how we need to try to help other folk to understand what really is going on. That is the significance in the word therefore in Hebrews 10, 19. In 10, 19, you see what he says to us, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holies of holies, by the blood of Jesus Christ. It takes, it takes, it's going to take some time for you to finally get, in fact about it, I'm almost sure somebody would like I, I was. Before I was actually converted, I used to believe that that was just a word that folk would say. But one day, it happened to me 
that can happen to the writer of this text on the road to Damascus. The Lord God Almighty changed my way of thinking and he gave me a patient of this preserving faith. God Almighty. Let me, I need to read. And then I'm going to come back and try to do it. And I'm going to hook. I want to hook verse 22 on to verse 23 to try to help us understand where I am and where you ought to be. Let us see W. Clark says many times that he was glad to be a member of the us crowd. After considering what he was has said and has said, I too have come to that conclusion. And I'm a member of the us crowd. Let us draw now with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscious and our bodies wash with the pure water. Us, thank God for those of us tonight who have finally come to that conclusion to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to become the head of your life. Don't play with yourself. It takes a little time for you to grow enough in faith of what the Lord is saying to say, let us. Let me make one other statement here. The book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish people who were contemplating the idea of moving from Judaism and accepting Christ as thy savior. And there were no doubt some, if not a bunch, who couldn't stand the pressure, the peer group of not being a part of Judaism. So they chose Judaism over Christ. So he says to us, let us draw now. Let us, verse 23, hold fast the profession of our faith. Having our heart sprinkled from an evil culture. Let us, without wavering, for God is faithful, that promise. In other words, what the Lord ha has promised. God keeps his promise. We are the ones that break our promises. Now, now let me, I will start to ask what they're gonna do. I start to ask, let me see the hands of all of you who have never broke your promise to the Lord, but I'm not going to ask you to jeopardize yourself like that. You know where you stand. And if we'd be fair with ourselves, most hands and toes, or fingers and toes, is more time, has more time than, we have more fingers and toes than times that we have made a promise and broke that promise with oh, the Lord. Holding fast, holding fast, holding fast. Our text open with an exhortation that followers on the first one in verse 22, let us say it, not in our text. What exactly is the preacher encouraging his people to do, given the word baptismal image of the previous of that profession. 
I'm wondering, are you professing what you're supposed to be a professor of? Oh yeah, we promise. According to what Paul said to Sir Timothy, that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're a believer, whether you said it or not, it was in the book and you just didn't read it, but you promised to do that. And we promise to study to show ourselves the proof unto God. That's something we, that would be a part of our profession. Now, confession was always a part of the baptism of the first Christians. Fact about it, to, for those of us now, today, now, and today, now, who say we are a part that we accept Christ. Rome Paul talks about it, that having uh, con received the word of God with our heart, we make a profession that we want to be baptized in his name. It was kind of a public vow of a commitment. We cannot, of course, know the exact contents of that confession that they made in years past, but both, but both scripture and the early Christian rites suggest that the early uh, confession was centered around the personal work and the work of Jesus. Personal work, oh yes. We used to sing the song, don't sing it no more. May the work that I've done speak for me. I wonder if that was going to be shown off the real reality of it, just what would your works say for you? What has you, what have you done? Did I told no beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot, of course, know the exact thing, but there is a warning of falling away. God understands his by circumstances of how strong the temptation was. That was for the Jewish people of that day. Them going back into Judaism versus standing for the Lord. Temptation to go back into Judaism, especially sometimes we I can folk sometimes. Or folk of eye color sometimes can give us a tough time. You can folk. Amen. And I know it happens a lot to women who have unbelieving husband. Amen. They will, they will try you so they can say to you, like I had a guy once. Another guy wasn't a, wasn't a believer, but this other guy was. And the guy finally came into a little money, and the other guy wanted him to pay him for what he has done, had done for him to help him to get it. And he wouldn't do it. So when he won another favor, the guy reminded him of what he hadn't done. He said to him, and you call yourself a Christian. Would do stuff like that to you. You call yourself a Christian. <laughs> they want to do everything they can to hurt you, but then when you finally stand up, then they want to say, You call yourself a Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, verses 24. Let us, this word, us, just keep on jumping up. Let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and to good work. Here's an interesting test to give yourself. When was the last time the Bible changed your mind about anything? 
your love, your sins, your hate, and especially your gifts. Amen. Many of us think this, that we can be a Christian without giving. Amen, lights. And the first thing you're going to have to learn how to give is you're going to have to learn how to give yourself. And if you ever learn how to give yourself, you will not have a problem with that of which the Lord allows you to come in possession of. No wonder Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now there by the three, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these three is love. And until you fall in love, oh, John used to sing that song. I like the way he's singing. Until you fall in love with Jesus, John said in that song, falling in love with Jesus is the greatest thing ever. Until you fall in love with Jesus, it means to fall in love with Jesus, you can have to fall out of love with yourself. First John 4.20 says, how can you say that you love me? One that you've never seen and hate your brother. I didn't say it, the book said, somebody is not telling the truth. Amen. So it takes a time for you to learn how to do that. So let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Pay attention. This word consider one another means to pay attention to one another. Focus your mind on helping other folk. Consider what, and sometimes folk right in our midst. We have not yet learned to consider how least that we are doing for them. We help support and, and encourage others along the way as being a part of disciples and offering help and to encourage each other. This is not a general call for helplessness. It has specific purpose. Believers are to provoke unto love and good works. The one to find the other. Love is not to be understood here as a vague, as a vague positive, most or merely a good feeling. Love is concrete. Concrete. When you love, when you love something or somebody, you're willing to give up even the stuff of yourself for your love. Amen. Stories told about a house once that caught on fire. Mother was very attractive. She was not in the house when the house caught on fire, but her daughter was in the house and she went into this house with flames on it. And she was burned furiously and her daughter because the way her mother was charted up. She had got what she wanted to disown her, but her mother had to remind her that I look like this because of the love that I had for you, that you could look like what you're looking. That's what God's son has done for us. It was love that moved him to go to the cross, not forsaking the assembly of your Let me change that word. Not forsaking the coming into the church together. <clears throat> I had some folk 
who think, and I don't have, I don't know how many I've had tell me that, that they can be just a good Christian at home without coming to church as they can by coming to church. Well, maybe you can, but come, <laughs> and I, I got a problem with it. Maybe you can, because I know this. When you're assembling yourself together as a matter of some, we'll learn how to exalt one another, that is to help one another as we see the day approach. In other words, help one another as we go along the way to keep them from falling into trap which when the day approaches me that what Hebrew 927 says, yes, I've been once appointed unto a man a day, a man that he must die. And after that, the judgment, that approaching day, you're gonna have to try to help people to do that. Not for sick of this, some of you. It's important. This author said to put 24 and 25 together. 24 simply says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaken this seminar of ourselves together as the man of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day of coming. God Almighty, love and good work are synonymous. They grow out of worship. Love. You see, folk being mean is because they haven't learned yet the importance of love. And this was especially true for the people to whom this message was first declared. Many of them were feeling social pressure to give up that commitment to Jesus. You're going to have it too. If you are in the house, that's why Paul says this. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, be ye not unequally yoked with non-believers, but there is no fellowship between believer and non-believer. And when you have an unbeliever in your house, you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be approached uh, to turn away from the Lord. Worship. This author says, worship is doubly important in light of the day that is approaching. The author of these words understood worship in a prophetic term. Worship deals with the true nature of reality, more especially in the world's reality of God reign over all things. That fact was especially important for a group of people who were beginning to disbelieve in the reality of that claim. The day approaching is meant to point to Jesus' the second coming or the day of death. You remember in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost come, where Jesus said he was coming back, he caught a cloud. He said he will be back. He will be back. I don't know when, but I know since he said he would, he will be back. Now, verse 26 just jumped out at my mind, and I made myself a note that said, perhaps you don't know it. Or you're not thinking. For if we willfully sin, I want to go with this one more time, because most of the stuff that we do, we willfully do it. For if we willfully sin, and we have received the knowledge of truth, there remain no sacrifice for sin. Ask yourself the question. How many times have you, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm not talking about before, that you knowingly and said, well, I'm going to do it one more time. Sin. Nobody but me been guilty of that. <laughs> I see. 
willfully sin. The, these words hearken back to Hebrews chapter uh, 6, verse 4 to 8. Chapter 6, verse 4 to 8. For it is impossible. I didn't write this. I'm just letting them read it. For those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and having tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they fall away, to maneuver themselves again into repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God first, and they have put his name to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh up off, is coming off up and bringeth forth herbs meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and now unto cursing, whose end is burn a buried. Many of us, we have been there, and uh, some of us are still there. We are there for two reasons. One is we don't know how important it is for us to walk to walk rather than talk to talk. And two is we have not really had that transformation to take place in our lives that Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. What does that say? I beseech you, I beg the brethren, therefore by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable services, and be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewingness of your mind. Your mind have got to change. And if your mind don't change, God Almighty, you are not going to change. So the cost of living the faith, in other words, have become too great for them to bear. The idea behind receiving the knowledge of the truth is found in the letter to the Apostle Paul. To willfully sin after having come to Christ carry the grave consequences of being cut off from the positive benefit of Christ's sacrifice of sin. Furthermore, yeah, we assume that the preacher is speaking to waving believers who wanted to return to Judaism. It also means that the old ritual cut off from them, having been in Christ. They had come to know that the animal sacrifice of which the Old Testament talked about could not remain a sacrifice anymore for them. Christ was the one that sacrifice his body, that we as earthen believers might live. He became the sacrifice. But a certain verse 27, a certain fearful look for judgment and fire in the nation we shall devour the adversary. Those this author says who continue to sin willfully 
can anticipate judgment and fiery indignation. Hebrew 9.27 It has been once appointed unto man that he must die. And after death, my brother and sisters, you're going to have to stand in the jail. And there's but one way that you're going to miss it. Christ is going to have to come back and rapture those of us who are in the wood out of the eyes, you're going to have to face the judgment. Amen. The word, the word judgment. Faithfulness, fear of God, drives out fear of everything, but disobedience a disobeying God should put people in fear because they have become his enemy. Amen. I was going to say the adversary, that means you are an enemy. There ain't no in the place. Either you are God's friend or you are an enemy to God. That's kind of hard, tough. Isn't it? Well, they don't. When the fact about it, well, you say, no, no, you, I'm neutral. No, 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 no. You ain't. You can't stand on neutral here. Either it's gonna be one or the other. Either you love God or you don't love Him. The question is, where do you stand? Disobeying God should put people in fear because they become God's enemy. Don't falter. Verse 28. He that despises Moses, lo. He that despises Moses, lo, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. The preacher now took a different, a different task of appealing in the Old Testament, for example, to support the run of the danger of falling away. The word translate despise is also translated in another way of rejecting the word of God, or falling away from the word of God. Deuteronomy 17 describes the punishment for an Israelite who wrote, wrote wickedness in the sight of God and transgressing his covenant by committing adultery. I wonder why they bring that up. I'm going to run a risk. And I say I don't have a single solitary person listening to my weak boys who are not guilty of either fornication or adultery or both. <laughs> I I'm just throwing this out. Some of us are gonna try to shake our head and lie to ourselves. I ought to get one witness. If I can't have nobody else with it but stand, I ought to have one witness here. All of us. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> all of us. Notice I didn't say all of you. All of us. Guilty. Can I get a witness here? And according to the Old Testament law, such a person should be put to death. You remember John chapter 8, where they brought Jesus, where they brought this woman to Jesus, and they told Jesus, Lord, we called her in the very act. According to Moses, she should be stoned to death. What do you say? 
Remember what I said? They brought the woman. The woman can't commit an act of adultery by herself. So they had left the other person. But it, I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. This woman was, they'd have brought her to her home. But this woman was terrified. She knows that according to the law, she was to be stoned to death. That means you had died a slow death. And she was petrified, if that's a good word, kneeling before Jesus with folk waiting with stones in her hand. I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. But when he finished writing on the ground, he rose himself up and he said to them, You that are without folk, cast or throw the first rock. The Bible said they were so convicted that from the oldest to the youngest, one by one, they dropped the rocks and went away. The woman still expected in a moment to feel these were on the stone. And Jesus said to a woman, Well, I thou accuse us. I suppose now she would raise up and look around. Don't see nobody that would hurt Jesus. She said, Lord, I don't have none. He said to her, neither do I. Go in peace and sin no more. Now, I don't know if that woman did it over again or not. But if she was the worst, it didn't matter, stand. <laughs> it just might have, would have happened again. Can I get a witness? And then we say, the Lord know my heart. I'm going to tell you, you telling the truth. The Lord know your heart. And the Lord knows that you are a wicked person. Or you despise the Lord knows. How much more so punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who have trodden foot on the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and that despised unto the Spirit of God. Verse 28 becomes clear as we recognize the lesser of the two forms of argument. Here, it takes the form of if X had been bad, think how much worse you would be. That is, if the consequences of falling away would die under the old covenant, consider how much work those consequences are on the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God, though. Well, this thing called G-R-A-C-E, Ephesians 289 says, for by grace uh, you say through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Grace, the gift of God comes no strength with no strength attached. Grace is more than that. Grace empowers us to take up our cross and follow Jesus, giving us the strength to undertake the path of disciples and service to others in his name. Think of all that is being given up when one rejects the spirit of grace. Therefore, we need the spirit empowerment today just as the ancient believers did, like those to whom this letter was originally written. We are weak, frail, torn, and tattered up to the point, but thank God for an easy way. Verse 30, I'm trying to close. For we know him, or at least we say we know him, 
that has said, Pinchon belongs to me. I will repay. Any of us have been reading in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 12, as we read about that, when by the time we get to verse 17 through 19, kind of scare you. Kenjan belong to me. I really appreciate the Lord. The Lord shall be the judge. So his consequences are certain for the preacher and his audience because they knew him who has spoke, because God spoke these words. They can certainly come to pass. The two quotations from the two quotations here are substantially drawn from the book of Deuteronomy, although either neither is an exact quotation. Verse that I've always saw and it's always bothered me. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands. Of an angry God. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hand of a living God. This phase living God occurs more often in the book of Hebrews than it does in any other Bible. This God, the only God that there is, sweeps away all gods of wood and stone, which has no God. In Isaiah 37, when Tennesseret was threatening Hezekiah, Hezekiah spread it his out before the Lord in chapter 37. And he realized that the God that he was serving was an evil God. Pass. Remember the past. But call to remember the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. I'm going to stop right there. In other words, after you receive the light of God, you have, you have been in a fight. First of all, you was in a fight with yourself, trying to convince yourself. Secondly, you were in a fight with others, who said they knew you and they knew only knew of you. Thank God though for his will. It is no different today than it was in that day. Culture pressure may vary from place to place and across the century, but the challenge of faithfulness remained the same. And I can hear the words of God jumping over the page saying to us, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of life. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness. And not for me only, but for all of them. That's, that's shouting time now. To know that if we would can hold on and maintain this faith that the author is talking about. When the end comes, a patient preserving faith. When the end comes, we too shall be able to go home to live with him who came into the world to give his life. That we may live live, live forever. I don't know my math is bad. I don't know how long forever is, but I know forever 
is shorter than eternity. Amen. Let us repeat. Repeat the mission pledge. I'm persuaded by the teaching of the blessed Bible. 